there are going to be times when you have spectacular weeks, when miracles are seen in your life, when fab fabulous things take place. And then there are going to be other times when nothing out of the ordinary happens, nothing physical, but it's all a part of the journey. And the journey is the destination. I found myself getting a little distracted this week. You know, I was up and down. I was having some car issues. And it was a struggle to keep reminding myself that the presence of the Lord was with me. And, you know, this is what the fight of faith it is. It is constantly reminding yourself and walking in that reality that the ruler of the universe himself lives inside of me and this is what the fight of faith is about so you know i was also reminded that there are two things there are two essential ingredients that must be present in order for any relationship to grow and develop one of those ingredients is time in order to get closer to someone and to know someone better you have to spend time with that person. I, I, I met Brother Dravko. I'm seeing his sister Nina. I met Brother Dravko and Sister Nina a few months ago. And I discovered that they are two of the warmest, most genuine people that I've ever met. But the sad part was that I only got to spend about two days with them because they live all the way in Serbia. So what is missing in our relationship right now is the ingredient of time. Because I still don't know when is Sister Nina's birthday. I still don't know what is Brother Dravko's favorite food or color. I don't know what side of the bed he likes to sleep on. And there are a lot of details about them that I don't know because we have not had the luxury of time. And so time is essential in any relationship. You can think of a situation where uh, a man and a woman are involved in a long distance relationship and they communicate via phone. I've, I've, I don't think there's any relationship like that I, I know of which has ever, work, ever, ever worked because no matter how you talk over the phone, that personal time together cannot be substituted. The other thing that is essential in a relationship is experience. The more experience you have with a person, the better you come to know and appreciate that person. Or, or the, the more quickly you separate yourself from that person as the case may be, right? I'll give you an example. I remember as a boy growing up, my, my father used to travel around Jamaica handing out tracks. It was the mark of the beast at the time, right? And as a little boy of nine, ten years old, he used to take me with him. We used to take the bus and travel around the country. And I enjoyed going with him and watching him battling to spread the word. So on one occasion, I remember we went into the bus park looking for a bus to go to Kingston. And for those of you who live in Jamaica, you understand that going into the bus park to look for a bus is a, it's a traumatic experience. It's almost like you're going to war. Because the minute you enter the gate, the conductors swarm from all directions trying to get you to go into their bus. It's like an army coming to attack you. And that's exactly what happened on this occasion, you know. And out of the crowd, one of the conductors, a huge man, still remember him to this day, full of muscles. He grabbed onto my little scrawny hand as a 10-year-old, and he started pulling me into his bus. My father stood up and he said, let go of my son. We are not going in your bus. The man looked at my father and he said, he's coming with me. You can go in another bus if you want. And he refused to let go of my arm. He started pulling and tossing me. And my father held on to my other arm and refused to let go. And you know, 
I stood and I remember vividly to this day, this, he, he reeked of alcohol and sweat. And this towering man stood there facing my considerably smaller father, who stood facing him and refused to let me go. And it was a standoff between the both of them for about five minutes. Right? He was determined aggressively and forcefully that I was going to go into the bus with him. And my daddy decided that he was not going to let go of my arm. And from a, a, a short while, it seemed like it was going to come to a physical altercation. Right? I was a bit worried for daddy because, as I said, he was considerably smaller than this guy. What eventually happened was that others around saw what were happening and they started saying to him, let go of the boy, leave him alone. And they started pressuring him. And eventually, with great spite and animosity, he threw my arm away, let go of me. But that experience at the age of 10 that I had with my father showed me that even if he was faced with physical danger, he would stand up to defend me. And at that moment, the perception I had of him changed. No matter how small he was or how scrawny, he was willing to stand up for me. And, and that experience helped to form an impression of him in my mind to this day. And you know, a few years ago, we were all driving in the car, the family. And I looked through the window and I saw the same guy. This time he was dressed in uniform and he, he had a long gun. Apparently he has been given some job as some security guard. And I pointed to him and I said, Daddy, you remember that guy? I said, the beast has been given a seat and great power. Now, Daddy laughed when I said it, and I laughed, but nobody else in the car could laugh because the only ones who could understand what I was saying was the both of us who had the experience. The others in the car didn't know what we went through, so they could not share the joke. So what I'm saying is that when you have an experience with someone, it forges the bonds of the relationship more strongly, and you learn about each other in those moments, and perceptions are formed. That is when you know what is inside somebody. It's the same with our relationship with the Lord. We must spend time with him. He's always with us. The question is, how much time do we make for him? And you know, I find that the days when I get up, and I, I don't talk to him much. I, I, I'm rushing through the day and I have no time for him. Those are the days when I don't have the peace, and the calmness and the assurance that I should have. And the days that I find to spend more time with him, I am at rest. The experiences he causes us to go through, he understands what I just said. He knows that these experiences are important because these are the moments when our relationship with him is forged stronger. He allows us to go through some difficulties sometimes. I, I, I prayed and asked him. There was a guy who was doing something for me recently and I prayed and asked the Lord. Before I got him, I said, Lord, is this the person I should use? And the Lord said to me, go ahead. And you know, the task that I gave the person to do, he, he made a complete mess of it. He cost me a lot of time, a lot of resources, and a lot of heartache. And I said, Lord, I asked you before, why did you allow me to choose this person? But all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. He knows what he's doing. And he understands that when we have experience with him, and we are in certain situations, and we can see the way he works and the way he gets us out of them. The bonds become stronger, and we understand our Father better. And at the end of it, we love him more. 
And so I haven't seen the reason why he allowed me to use this person yet, but I'm trusting and waiting that I'll see that it was worth it at the end of it all. So what I'm saying is invest our time in him. Trust the experiences that he allows us to go through because these are both important and he knows what we need and when we need it. All right, now I, I'm going to just invite you to bow your heads with me as we begin. That wasn't my message this morning. Father, as we're about to discuss your words this morning, I have that what you want to say will be heard, not what I wish to say. And I ask that at the end of it, all of us will understand you better and be drawn closer to you. I ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so what I want to share this morning is nothing new. I just want to give a different perspective. As a child growing up, there is a little poem that I learned, which I'm sure most of you on here this morning know as well. It's called The Heights by Great Men. And in fact, that's the title of my presentation this morning. The poem goes like this. The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight. But they, while their companions slept, we're toiling upwards through the night. I see Sister Tina reciting the words along with me. And I, as I said, I'm sure most of you know it this morning, right? I learned this poem and I used it throughout my life to help to motivate myself on many occasions. What it means is that the men who became great in the eyes of the world, the men who achieved seemingly impossible things, did not just get up and decide that they were going to be great. It was a process by which they toiled and worked and labored while others around them were doing simple, average, normal things. They were going above and beyond what the common man was doing to get to where they got. And if you look at some of the men around the world who, who are considered great, you will understand what I'm saying. You know, they said that the average basketball player practices for about three hours each day. Michael Jordan, who is considered probably the greatest basketball player, he practiced for seven days a week, seven hours every day. Right? That is more than double what the average player practices. Uh, Mike Tyson, considered one of the greatest boxers of all time. He trained for 10 hours every day, while the average boxer trains for about four or five hours. Right? Again, more than double what the average man did. And then Tiger Woods, probably the, the best golfer, they said that he trained for 13 to 14 hours every day. Think about that. So if he starts training at 6 in the morning, he'll get done at 8 in the night. Right? That was more than a, a passion. That was an obsession to train all those hours all day, every day. But the outcome of it was that he became, you know, what the world considers great. So the poem is true in that when you set your heart upon something with single-minded focus and dedication, and you put all your efforts and energies into it, then it is possible for you to become good. It is possible for you to become very good, and in some cases, it's possible for you to become great at whatever you set your focus upon, right? These men that I just mentioned, they became great in sports because that is what they set their hearts upon. There are others that are considered, who are considered great in business, in education, in politics, in other areas of life. And the world looks upon these men and they call them great and they call them legends and they idolize them. But all of these accomplishments did not come 
by merely sitting and wishing it would happen, right? They had to work hard to accomplish whatever it is that they set their minds upon. In fact, there's a section of the brain, for those of you who do science, there's a section of the brain called the reticular activating system. Now, what this part of the brain does is that it enables you to focus single-mindedly upon whatever you choose to focus upon, right? I remember at one point in my life, I decided that I wanted to buy a car. And I decided that the car I wanted to buy was a red Honda. And I, you know what? I, I'll tell you something. For weeks and months when I went on the road, you know what I saw everywhere I went? Only red Hondas. And I asked myself the question, where were these red Hondas all along? The truth is that they were always there, but I had not focused on them before. So now that my mind was made up that this is what I wanted, the reticular activating system in my brain filtered out everything else and focused exclusively on what I wanted. You, you, you ever lose your key? and you start looking for it, everything that glistens or flashes or glints, your eye will identify it immediately because your reticular activating system focuses all your mental capacities on something little and silver and shiny. Whatever you choose to train it upon, that is what it will focus on. God gave us all that ability. And so everybody listening to me this morning can choose. You can choose to be good at something. You can choose to be very good at something. And if you have certain innate abilities, you may even be great at it, right? I've never been great at anything in my life. But there are some things that I have trained my attention upon that I have become very good at. So... Whatever you choose to focus upon, you can become great at it. What does God say? We should focus that dedication, that reticular activating system, that single-minded focus upon. Well, we can find the answer to that in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, right? The rich young man came to Jesus and asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I'll read what it says, even though we can quote it by heart. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. This verse encapsulates what our existence is for. You should love the Lord mentally, physically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, and whatever other alley that you can think of. This verse is saying that single-minded focus that they put upon sports and they put on business and they put on education and they put on everything else and they become great at those things. The Bible is saying all of that must be focused on loving the Lord thy God. That is what God wants. He doesn't care if I can run as fast as Bolt, or I can dunk as well as Jordan, or I can put as well as Woods. Loving the Lord is what matters to God. He goes further in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23, and look at what he says. Thus said the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. So if you have a PhD or a master's, and you are considered great by the world, God doesn't consider that. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. You can throw the shot put a hundred feet and break ten world records. God is not impressed by that. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. You own five houses and a hundred cars and you are considered mighty in the financial world. God is not impressed by that. But let him that glory, glory in this, 
that he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am the Lord which exerciseth loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, said the Lord. Not in athletic prowess or business nows or entrepreneurship. And the Bible is full of verses, you know. The Bible says, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with what? With all your heart. And this is the desire of God's heart. This is the main purpose why he gave us this drive, this determination, this ability to focus wholeheartedly upon something and go for it with unbridled passion. He wants us to use that ability to forge a relationship with him. Unfortunately, men use this to become great at sports and business and education and everything else and know not the Lord. Now I want to point out something to you that I found fascinating. I want to point out something that I found I was jealous when I discovered this, right? There are two worlds. The, wor the world that we live in, people consider greatness to be when you can run faster than everybody else, when you are stronger than everybody else, when you are richer than everybody else. That is what is considered greatness down here. But there's another world out there that is far more vast and far greater, and that is the real world. And I want you to, re to realize what greatness is in that world. I want you to realize what greatness is in that world. Job chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. I know we all know the passage, but I'm not sure we have ever looked at it in this light before. You know, Satan comes to God. Let me read it. Job chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So here we have a convention in heaven when all beings in the universe gather together before the throne of God. Satan comes with them, and he starts bragging about what is happening on earth. He starts bragging about how he run things on earth, and how he's in control, and he starts pointing out his champions, the mighty men of earth, the athletes, the warlords, the chieftains. Look at what God says in verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? Why? Because he's a great athlete? No. Because he's a great financial mind? No. He's a great entrepreneur? No. He's a perfect and upright man. One that feareth God. That is what God considers greatness to be. One that feareth God. Imagine this, brethren. The whole universe is gathered before God. Everybody is focused on him and paying attention to what he says. And God is bragging. I'm using that word for want of a better word. God is bragging about one man and bigging him up before the whole universe and calling the focus of the whole universe on this one person. That is greatness. That is what I would want. I would want God to sit up there and say, look, I have a son called Daniel on earth. Look at him. I am proud of him. That is my boy. That is what I would want. My heart burned when I read this. Because that is what is considered great in heaven. When God himself sits and brags about me and says, look at my son. I'm proud of him. All of you look. He never said, there's a mighty war chief among the Amaleks. The Amalekites. There's a great athlete among the Moabites. There's a mighty champion among the Israelites. He pointed to this little feeble man. He said, that is the one I'm proud of because he fears me. 
that is what heaven considers greatness. And what I want to point out from this passage is that they are watching us, right? The world out here is watching Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods and Usain Bolt and the champions of this world. There's a greater world up there and they are watching us. And the greatness that they see in us is not the same as the greatness that the world sees among men down here. So in the eyes of the universe and in the eyes of God himself, Job was great. And what I want to do is point out a couple other champions from the Old Testament who were great. And I want to highlight a few things that I believe made these men great. I'm reading from Numbers chapter 12. I'm just going to read a few verses here. It says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. That's a very telling verse. Moses was the man who stretched his hand across the Red Sea and caused the very laws of nature themselves to be reversed. Never before had a man parted a sea in two. Moses was the man who called down ten plagues upon Egypt, the most famous nation of the world at that time. The whole land knew about this man. He was famous. He was well known. He was feared. But the Bible says Moses was the meekest man on earth. The meekest man. And it strikes me. And it dawns upon me. That in the eyes of heaven, greatness, true greatness, begins with meekness before God. So that is one of the things that made Moses great. But there is something else that God said about Moses which caused my heart to burn. You know, Aaron and Miriam started complaining about Moses and contending that they should have equal rights as Moses and they were just as righteous and holy as Moses look at what God himself says to Aaron and Miriam in Numbers chapter 12 I'm going to read from verse 4 it says and the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam come ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation and they three came out and the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. Listen to what the Lord himself says about Moses now. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. So God is saying, If I find anybody among you, who has the ability to be a prophet? I'll come to that person in a dream or a vision. Verse 7. My servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth. Even apparently and not in dark speeches. Imagine God saying that about a man. God is saying, I'll speak to everybody else in a dream or a vision. But Moses is not so. I talk to him. The Bible says, face to face. As a man speaks to his friend. What a privilege. If I was alive in those days, Moses is the man I would have wanted to be. God says, he is different. It's just like if I... If I want to make an appointment to see Joe Biden this morning, I make the appointment. It would probably he, Biden would probably leave office, and that appointment would never be fulfilled. Right? You have to go through all kinds of protocol and red tape if you want to meet a world leader. God says of Moses, "I speak to him not like I speak to everybody else, but face to face. He is different from the rest of you. He." is my friend and i speak to him mouth to mouth face to face what a privilege 
That is greatness. But yet the Bible says Moses was the meekest man on earth. The meekest man on earth. And what did Moses really want? Did he want to be rich? Did he want to be more famous than he already was? Did he want to be the greatest leader in Israel? Was that Moses' focus? Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18. Moses speaking to God. And here we can see the desire of Moses' heart. Here we can see what Moses' single-minded focus was. Here we can see what he trained his reticular activating system upon. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, I implore thee, I beg thee, make me richer. Make me more famous. Show me thy glory. This is what Moses wanted. That is all he asked God for. Show me your glory. Teach me more about you. Draw me closer to you. And God was pleased. God was happy. Right? And God gave him a little flash. He showed him his back. But the desire of Moses' heart was to hunger and thirst for God. And that made him great. That made him great. Moses was on the mountain for 80 days. That is almost three months if you calculate it. 80 days, no food, no water. And what was he up there doing? Was he up there utilizing Wi-Fi and the internet? Was he on Facebook or WhatsApping? All he had for three months in the wilderness was his friend. And all he wanted was to see his glory, to be closer to him. And you know, God could not stay away from such a man. He came and called him to heaven before Christ came. That was true greatness. The meekest man on earth. And if I was alive in those times, I wouldn't want to be Joshua. I wouldn't want to be Caleb. I would have wanted to be Moses. The man of whom God said, I don't want to speak to him in a dream or a vision. I want face-to-face -face communion. What a privilege. I want to also highlight Elijah. Another champion of the Old Testament. You know, he was also translated to heaven before the appointed time. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, I see another critical clue in understanding what made these men great. Look at what Elijah says in verse 1 of chapter 17. He, he, Elijah appears to Ahab. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 15, And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. Now, there are two phrases in both those verses, and I'm sure you pick them up. Elijah comes before Ahab, the king of Israel. Ahab is surrounded by dignitaries and statesmen and guards and splendor and magnificence. And this rugged man appears before him. And Elijah says, long live the king. God save the king. May the king live forever. I bow down and salute you, your highness. No, 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 no. As the Lord God liveth, before whom I stand. Now note that Elijah was standing in front of the king of Israel. He was standing before Ahab, but yet look at what he says. As the Lord God liveth, before whom I stand. In the presence of this worldly grandeur and splendor and magnificence and pomp, 
one thing was present in the mind of Elijah. I am standing in the presence of God. No matter where I am, no matter where I go, no matter who I'm faced with, I stand before the Lord of hosts. He is the one who I acknowledge. He is the one I recognize. He is the only one to whom I am accountable. And he's the only one that matters, no matter where I am. Even if I stand before the greatest man on earth, it's the Lord God before whom I stand. And that was his catchphrase. That was his motto. There was a guy who used to worship in our fellowship a few years ago. And every time somebody was preaching, you know, he didn't say amen. He liked to say, truly, truly. And over the years, he came to be called, we, 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 we came to call him truly, truly, because of the word that he kept using. If Elijah was alive today, we would probably have to call him before whom I stand or something like that. But Elijah was not just speaking words when he used this phrase. It was the reality in which he lived. It was his way of life, right? It's just like it was said of Enoch that Enoch educated himself to ever feel that he was in the presence of God. It was the same thing with Elijah. No matter where he went or who he was faced with or who stood before him or what power they had, I stand. And I am accountable, and I recognize, and I acknowledge only the Lord of hosts. He is the one before whom I stand. And that made Elijah great. That made Elijah great. Not his physical prowess, not his financial ability. Not his knowledge of politics and protocol that he should observe when he entered Ahab's court. He was always standing before the Lord of hosts. That is why he would call down fire from heaven. So Elijah was great. And you know, there are others in the Old Testament that I could highlight who were great. The Bible says of Daniel that he was a man greatly beloved, right? An angel came from heaven to say that to Daniel. He, he, he referred to him by this title. He said, you are greatly beloved. And I am submitting to you that when it says that Daniel was greatly beloved, it was not talking only about God. He was beloved by God, but not only God, right? What angel was saying to him is that we are in heaven. All of us in heaven are watching you and we're seeing the way you stand up for God. And we all love you up there. Up there you're a champion. Up there your name is spoken about. Up there you are great. You are a man greatly beloved by the universal community. What a privilege. What an opportunity. If my name is being called up there and nobody sees me or recognizes me down here, I am set. I'm okay with that. Right? Daniel was a man greatly beloved. Bless Amen. The Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And there are others, as I said, you know, it says the Bible says of David that he was a man after God's own heart. It says of Abraham, God refers to Abraham as, and I think this is one of the most beautiful phrases in the Bible. God Almighty referred to Abraham as my friend forever. You know, we have a phrase that we use in our modern society. It's the, it's the phrase BFF, right? BFF it means best friends forever. It's normally shared between two lovers or two best friends. God and Abraham were BFFs. And this was Abraham saying that. It was God himself who said, Abraham is my friend forever. And I, I, I listen to God saying these things about men. And my heart burns within me. And I'm jealous because I want him to say these things about me. These men focus their intellect and their attention and their physical abilities and everything they had 
upon knowing the God of heaven, and that made them pray. But all of these men, champions of the Old Testament, were missing something. So we come to the greatest of all the prophets in Luke chapter 7 and verse 28. The greatest of the prophets. And this was said by Jesus himself. For I say unto you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So more than Moses, more than Elijah, more than Enoch, more than Daniel and David and all of these champions of the Old Testament, John the Baptist was the greatest of them all. And it's hard to understand why at a, at a superficial look, because Moses parted the Red Sea, Elijah called down fire from heaven, David killed a giant. What did John the Baptist do? What made John greater than all of them? Because John had the opportunity to see what all of these prophets before him could only dream of. John saw with his own eyes what Moses asked God for. John saw with his own eyes what Elijah dreamed of and what Enoch dreamed of. But none of them ever got the opportunity to see the true glory of God. So John was the herald. He was the messenger. He was the one who cleared the way for the true glory of God, the true greatness of God to be seen on earth. John not only saw Jesus, but John was able to touch him. Right? John was the one who baptized him. He had the opportunity to do what Moses never got to do. John touched him. But despite all the greatness that these men of the Old Testament had, they never got to see the true glory of God. Moses only saw flashes of it. Elijah only saw flashes of it. David only saw flashes of it. But in the coming of the only begotten Son of God, something was seen that was never seen on this earth before. As John says, in John chapter 1 and verse 14. He says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What Moses saw was a glimpse of God's back. What Elijah saw when he called down fire from heaven was a glimpse of God's power. What Samson saw when he ripped the land in two was a glimpse of God's power. The true glory of God, the real thing, was seen in the face of his only begotten son. When Jesus took babies and put them on his lap and wiped their tears and rebuked his disciples for trying to chase them away, when Jesus did that, that was the true glory of God. When Jesus allowed a sweaty, stinking, presumptuous human to lean on his breast and Jesus put his arms around him and enjoyed having him there, that was the true glory of God. That was the true glory of God. When Jesus was being murdered, when demons were shrieking around him and gloating in his face and destroying him and he chose to die, rather than allow his universe to be harmed, choosing to give up his own life so that they could be safe. That was the true glory of God, full of grace and truth. Nothing like it had ever been seen in the universe before. Moses never saw it. Elijah never saw it. It was a light that was brighter than anything that had ever been seen in the universe before. That was the true glory of God who he is that was his true glory and you know what john touched it 
But look at what the last part of the verse in, in, in Luke 7, verse 28 says. It says, John was the greatest, but guess what? But he that is least, the least, that's you, brother Joshua. That's you, brother Randall. That's me. He that is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Just stop and internalize that for a moment. Just stop and think about that. So, Sister Tina, this morning, if you have been born again, you are mightier than Moses. You are mightier than Elijah. You are mightier than Daniel. And that is not my word. That is the words of Jesus himself. If you have been born again, you are great. You are great. Because inside of you lives the glory of God Almighty himself. Because what is God's glory? You know what is God's glory? Jesus is the glory of God. Jesus is the glory Amen. of God. So when Jesus lives inside of me, Amen. what Moses has to see Amen. lives inside of me. What Elijah got a glimpse of, the fullness of that lives inside of me. What John only touched but didn't get to fully see, that lives inside of me. So inside of me, I have the glory of God. What's the privilege? No prophet in the Old Testament could ever make that claim. And so all of us this morning are greater than any of those men ever could be. Hallelujah. Amazing. And so, I am saying to you this morning that if you have been born again, they are talking about you in heaven constantly. Your name is being called. Job had nothing on you. Moses had nothing on you. Your name is being called because when the heavenly hosts look on earth, and they see brother Joshua. They're not seeing Joshua Ramsami. They are seeing the glory of God. They are seeing the glory of God, which has never been seen on this earth before. Now, I want to point out something else to you before I wrap up. I want to point out something else to you. When you have been born again, immediately you become great. But it does not stop there. It does not stop there. You have inside of you the living life of Christ, but it does not stop there. The capacity now exists for you to become even greater in the kingdom of God. And I'm going to show you what I mean. Look at what Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 4. It says, at the same time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus, as he liked to do, you know, he was such a great teacher. He didn't just say things. He used analogies and examples and hypothetical situations and parables. Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted. So you must be converted first. You must be born again first. And become as little children. Ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of God. And there are the words of Jesus himself. When you are born again, your journey does not stop there. In order to be greater, you must humble yourself as a little child. You must deny yourself. You know, my son is 13 months now. And he is the joy of my life. I'm watching him develop every day and, and learning new things, right? He's learning to walk now. But when he walks by himself, He's very uncertain 
and he, he, he takes his time and he holds on to things and he's very faltering. So what he will do, he will turn around and hold his arm up. And when he does that, he expects me to hold his hand, right? The minute that he feels my hand in his, he takes off at top speed, not worrying about whether he's going to fall, not worrying about whether he's going to collide into something or he's going to hurt himself. As long as he can feel my hand holding his, he has no fear of anything. This is the attitude that the Bible says we should have when we are born again. As little children, when you accept that new birth, you must be completely helpless and defenseless in the hands of Jesus. That is the first thing that Jesus says. But he does not stop there. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26. And you know, the first, when I was younger and I read this verse, I could not understand it. I could not abide it. But now I understand fully what Jesus was saying. Amen. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Look what it says. It says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. The first few times I read this, I thought, Jesus is unreasonable. He's saying I cannot follow him unless I hate all these people. Is that what he's saying? Of course not. But you know what I have learned? Having failed and been battered by sin and seen my own shortcomings and realizing that I can do nothing. And if I live my own life, I'm going to continue failing and ending up in disaster and disgrace and finding a person who is with me every second of the day. I can talk to him any time. I have access directly to the throne of God. I am a son of God. You know what? Anybody who tries to take that away from me, I am declaring it to you now. You are my enemy. Anybody who tries to break my relationship with my God is my enemy. And if that person is my brother, my mother, my sister, my wife, any person, that person must be removed from the way. Nothing must come between me and my daddy. Nothing. And if you come to the place where nothing matters but him, where you will not allow anything to interfere in that relationship, then in the kingdom of God, you are great. In the kingdom of God, you have achieved greatness. Your name is ringing in heaven and they are proud of you. So Jesus does not mean you should literally hate your brethren, just to make that clear. Right? What he's saying is that you should seek him with such single-minded focus and determination that nothing breaks that. When Tiger Woods trains for 13 hours each day, you can guarantee that nobody would call him on the phone to disturb him. You can guarantee that they couldn't call him to keep running on the road to do errands. He was focused only on his training because it was the most important thing in the world to him. It's the same steadfastness and determination with which we must grasp that relationship with Christ. Nothing is more important than that and nothing must interfere with that. That is what Jesus was saying. If it's even your wife, cut her off. That is the path to true greatness. Finally, I'm going to give you the coup de grace, the ultimate key, the ultimate answer to what will make me the greatest person in the kingdom of God, what will make the angels look in wonder 
And what will make God himself call my name and say, that is my son. I am proud of him. This is the ultimate key. And anybody who does this, I can guarantee you. I guarantee you greatness. In John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, Jesus gives the ultimate and absolute key to greatness. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. What will happen if you abide? I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth some fruit the same bring it forth a reasonable amount of fruit the same bring it forth much much fruit there are some christians brethren who bring forth no fruit there are some christians who bring forth just a little fruit the bible says those who abide in him will bring forth much fruit much fruit they will be great all the works of god will be seen in them and their names will be legends in heaven and the verse ends by saying for without me ye can do nothing you must be as meek as moses was as jesus said you must be as a little child and recognize he is everything and i am nothing that is the heart of true greatness in the kingdom of god that is true greatness and so i took the poem that i learned as a child and i modified it and it will be my new motto from this day until the day i enter heaven The heights by great men, reached and kept, were not attained by sudden flight. But they, while their companions slept, abided in the Lord of life. That is the true key to greatness. So, brethren, in closing, go and abide every second of every day. Abide in him. And you will be great in the kingdom of God. Thank you for listening so attentively this morning. May God bless you and be great.